I want to say it to my babies <laughs> that your mama loves you so much and your daddy, these whole families love you so much. And you guys have got to be strong because you are, we, 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 I just know, I just feel in my heart that you're okay, but you got to take care of each other. And your mom and daddy are going to be right here waiting on you when you get home. Don't believe a word Susan Smith says. Car was pulled from a murky lake Thursday. The bodies of the boys were strapped in the back seat. An autopsy revealed the boys were not killed beforehand. They drowned. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Susan Smith, the murdering mommy who killed her two little babies, drowning them in Lake John D. Long in 1994. And let me tell you, this is one of the most disturbing cases of all time. Well, it's one of the top ones. I actually had two babies the same age as Susan Smith. And the whole world was just riveted by this story. And then it ends this way. Let's get right into the story, okay guys? Susan had a turbulent childhood to say the least. When she was six years old, her father committed suicide, and Susan seemed to never really regain a healthy mental state. When she was 13 herself, she attempted suicide and was treated for major depression. Things just seemed to get worse for Susan when her mom married a local church member and a leader in the church, Beverly Russell, who was a big church leader in the community, um, he proceeds to molest Susan from the time that she was 13 years old all the way up until three months before the murders. They, <clears throat> they were having a sexual relationship all the way up. Her stepfather, Beverly Russell, <clears throat> admitted fully in court that he uh, was molesting her and that uh, he caused her a lot of damage. Finally, in March of 1991, she meets and marries David Smith. They proceed to have two children, Michael in October of 1991 and Alexander in August of 1993. David works as a manager at a grocery store and Susan works as a secretary at a manufacturing plant. Where in this job, she begins a romantic sexual affair with her boss, the owner's son, who is also married with children. This is becoming a really big theme with Susan, if you don't notice. From all reports, Susan to David's marriage was not a good one. A lot of adultery, a lot of splitting up, getting back together, which it's very known now that, yes, there was a lot of adultery. She was sleeping with her stepfather, and she was also having the affair with her boss. Finally, in the summer of 1994, they call it quits. No more. They're not getting back together. They're actually going to divorce. They're trying to keep it a low-key divorce, but you know how that goes sometimes, and it doesn't stay low-key. Five days before the murder, a huge argument ensues between David and Susan, uh, where at some point David gets into Susan's purse and finds a love letter from Tom Finley, the man that she is having the affair with at her job. At this point, David threatens to expose the affair to Tom Finley's wife and to the town, and it's getting really ugly. Susan does not take this well at all. This seems to have started her spiral uh, out of control. This is five days before. Also, the de same day that this occurred, she confided in a friend who testified later that she had said, I wonder what life would be like without these children. So she was already seemed to be contemplating her life without children. This is getting to the sad part. On October 25th, the day of the tragedy, Susan Smith took her kids to daycare that morning. She works that day. 
but she is not having a good day. Tom has broken off their relationship, and she has been in a fit for a few days now. Things are really going wrong. She's not in a good state of mind. She goes, gets off work at 3.30 and goes and picks up the babies from daycare. <clears throat> it's reported then she goes to a bar. She doesn't go in the bar, but she sees some friends outside the bar. And she's very distraught and basically just completely consumed with this Tom guy. And all she can think about and all she can talk about reportedly by her friends are that he, she's obsessed with this Tom guy. And around 7.30 or 8 at night, she's so wound up and upset, she says that she needs to go for a drive and clear her mind. And we go with this driving. She straps her little babies in the car seats. She states that she went to Walmart and did a little bit of shopping and then leaves Walmart and heads off to her friend's house. Uh, but she never makes it. At some point between Walmart and going to her friend's house, she's at a stoplight. And a black man jumps in her car and puts a gun to her side and tells her to drive or he will kill her. So she, of course, obliges. She runs off, drives, drives, drives. And they drive about 10 minutes down the road. And he tells her to stop right in front of the lake area. John D. Long Lake. So she and tells her to get out. He's taking her car. According to Susan, he drives away in the car and... She then is left out in the middle of the lake area, and she runs to a home, and they call 911. The police, the FBI, and everybody get involved. They get dogs, they get helicopters, they get the sheriff, the uh, FBI, the uh, sled, the south, uh, I mean, everybody is involved in this, and they are frantically looking for this babies. Susan gets on TV, she's crying, David states that when he goes to Susan this night, she is hysterical. She is on the floor. She He can't even control her. He's got to pick her up. She's just out of control emotionally. Susan describes this man as a that hijacked her car and stole their kids as a black male between 30 and 40 years old, 6 foot tall, 175 pounds, which apparently is half of this community. It's a third of the whole county. It's basically, this is this is a very vague uh, description of this guy. It's basically any black guy in the county, pretty much, you know. And most news sources don't even, especially the local ones, don't even post this description of this man for some reason. Two days into it, they give Susan a lie detector test. And she proceeds to fail it miserably. When the FBI um, asks harder question towards her, she gets very irate and very defensive and does not want to cooperate with them at that point. Uh, they continue to search and search and search. Well, this is the day two, three, they are, they are not feeling it. They're really, the things they're getting from her, they're not getting. So after doing a few little bit of investigation, they go to Walmart. She did not go to Walmart. They get in contact with the friend. The friend says she wasn't even home that night. Then to top it off, the cherry on top, they, the FBI does a, drives the same route that she went, and come to find out at that time of night, the light does not even switch. It's basically a blinking light. She would not even have to have stopped at it. Got in a car at the exact same time of day that she said it happened, and we decided to drive the route to see what it was like. What we realized really quickly is that that light doesn't turn red at that time of the night because there's so little traffic. I went to Sheriff Wells, I remember this, and I said, that light blinks. So they are proving her wrong constantly. They get Susan back in to talk to her and she changes her story. She flips. So then at this point, they're like, okay, something is really wrong. The police report that she's more concerned with what she looks like on TV. Also, if you'll notice in the clips that are online or the clips that are in this video, you will notice Susan does not shed one tear. She also tends to talk about the babies in the past tense, which is a huge red flag for police but one of the things that really bothered us even in 1994 this is even in 1994 was that 
she never cried. You literally never. She would get on there and blah, and never cry. She would just be trying so hard and you never would see her cry. So this is huge too, by the way. This is a huge, huge story. It's all over the news every night. This is 1994. This is before everybody had news constantly, but it was on the news a lot. Finally, on the ninth day, these babies are gone. Nobody's found them. They really have a bad feeling. They're like, okay, this is not right. I think she's cracking. They all, Her and David go on the morning shows and do interviews. And in these interviews, you can fully see a change in her appearance, in her demeanor, and... You could just really see a difference in Susan. Hurts to know that um, that I would be accused or even thought that I would ever do anything to harm my children. As a mother, it's only a natural instinct to protect your children from any harm. And the hardest part of this whole ordeal is not knowing if your children are getting that what they night. Need. Day nine, after all the media blitz, Susan is in the church where she's been spending a lot of time while the boys are missing, and she is with police where they have been interviewing her very nicely. She proceeds to break down to the sheriff of Eugene and writes a full confession. In this confession, she states she was planning on killing herself and her children, and that she drove down the lake to the edge, then got out, pulled the emergency brake, and watched her babies drown. Really, really, really sad. When the sheriff made the announcement that they had arrested Susan immediately and were charging her with two counts of first-degree murder. Susan Smith has been arrested and will be charged with two counts of murder in connection with the deaths of her children Michael, three, and Alexander, 14 months. The vehicle, a 1990 Mazda, driven by Smith, was located late Thursday afternoon in Lake John D. Long, near Union. The crowd is audibly gasp, and I can promise you the whole world gasp. Even though maybe the press had been saying, leaning towards that, you still can't, like, wrap your head around it. You really can't think, no, she didn't. But she did, and she admitted it, and they were charging her with first-degree murder of both the boys, and um, they were going af after the death penalty. This did in Union County on or about October 25th, 1994, felonously, willfully, and with malice of forethought, kill one Alexander Tyler Smith by means of drowning and said victim died as a result thereof. State of South Carolina versus Susan Smith, indicted for murder, and indicted for alleged Susan Smith did in Union County on or about October 25th, 1994, feloniously, willfully, and with malice of forethought, killed one Michael Daniel Smith by means of drowning and said victim died as a result thereof. The family, the grandparents, uh, on the dad's side and David um, were very, 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 very intent on wanting the uh, death penalty. They were not happy with Susan. They really hated Susan and they expected her fully to get the death penalty. As the trial begins for Susan, the next few months, people come and testify about these affairs, about the sexual abuse, about her mental health. Um, people are getting testifying that they are they are devastated. They are devastated by the death. Also, Susan is constantly asking for the death penalty, saying she wants to die. She's on suicide watch. At one point in the trial, the prosecution played a tape of the an exact car of Susan rolling down a hill, going into the lake, and there was cameras in the car mounted on the dashboard basically showing you the view that Michael and Alex had while they were being drowned and it is one of the worst things you can watch. Relevant now on the issue of just what could have been done to save the children and how long uh, was the time frame in which something could have been done.
And that was kind of emotional for me. I didn't didn't realize it would take a car that long to sink. It was like five minutes, 52 seconds, something like that. And they took all the sound away, but made it even more eerie. They took all the sound away in the courtroom. You just sitting there watching that car float out in the water. And every time I see it, I hold my breath. I just think, oh my gosh, these babies are in there and they can't breathe. They can't, that's it. They're gone. And she's standing on the beach. You know these kids were screaming for her. Mommy, help me. Mommy, can you imagine? And her standing there and letting it happen. But look, and and they were trying to also say, hey, she had time to rescue him. I don't hardly, I don't think she could have rescued him. I mean, if she could, she might have been able to rescue one, if that. But yeah, the trial's pretty much open and shut. She's found guilty. We go to the penalty phase, and it's whether she gets life or she gets death. Uh, once all the facts were in and people testified for and against her and all that stuff, she basically, she ended up with life sentence with parole. Family, uh, David Smith was not happy, um, but that is the end of the case. She is sentenced to 30 years with parole, which she will be up for parole in four years from the day I'm filming this and uh 2024 the question is will she get out one of the main things you need in uh getting parole is admitting guilt which she's 100 percent already done that she'll be in her 50s when she does get out now will david and his family fight her being released i don't know the last interview that david smith did he uh was had moved on, he'd gotten married, had two kids, but he's still extremely traumatized by this. And um, he said he did have to forgive her for his mental health because he was very suicidal and... Uh, Many years, it took a long time, but I finally forgiven her because not forgiving her, that was... That was eating me up. You know, did not want to go on living either, but he had to forgive her. But does that mean he's going to allow her to walk around or is he going to go fight for her to stay in prison? Susan also has been caught two times, not one time, two times having sex with correctional officers. She's been reprimanded for that. They were fired. She is also was also on like a date, a prisoner website, which she's since removed. In an interview on the 20th anniversary Susan states, something went wrong that night. I was not myself. I was a good mother. I loved my voice. There was no motive, and it was not even a planned event. I was not in my right mind. Alex was 14 months old. He just had had a birthday, and Michael was three years old. So what do you think? Do you think Susan should have got the death penalty? Do you think she deserves parole? Do you think that her child abuse and her tragic traumatized childhood had something to do with her do you think she's just a psycho bitch the more i did watch some of the, and read some of these things the more i definitely think the lady had some serious mental problems obviously some issues with men and some abandonment issues and things like that. Lots of us do, including me. Do we kill our children? No. Um, have I been feeling that low in my life before? Yes. Um, so I did have sympathy, some sympathy for Susan. Uh, do I think she needs to get out? I, I honestly don't know. Did she deserve death? I really don't know either. At I, I first, like I said, when I started this, I was like, yes, death. In a way, I was kind of glad that she got life because she would have to suffer her whole life knowing, living with herself as a murderer of her own little bitty innocent children. Innocent children. If you like this video, stick around. I've got more Murdering Mommies coming up. I'm going to do Diane Downs. I may cover Casey Anthony. I'm going to cover Andrea Yates. Um, there's some other ones. If you have suggestions, leave them down there in the comments. I'll look through and see if I can pull together a video. 
thanks for watching and I will be back really soon with another video and thanks so much for supporting me by the way all my new followers our subscribers <laughs> thanks and I will see y'all soon